only 14 episodes, one half of one season. What happened to the Planet of the Apes live action TV show? Let's find out. Movies, music, and monsters. Man, did I love this show as a kid. I was really young when this came out. I think I was six. Apes that talk. How cool is that? The original Planet of the Apes theatrical film was not only a huge box office success, but a worldwide phenomenon. Based on Pierre Boulle's original 1963 novel, producer Arthur P. Jacobs, director Franklin Schaffner, and the genius makeup of John Chambers revolutionized not only modern cinema, but also started one of the most popular franchises in Hollywood history. If it hadn't been for Arthur Jacobs' tenacity, I don't think that uh, that material ever would have been made because I thought it was too expensive. Planet of the Apes a film that spawned not only four very successful theatrical sequels, a very strange little animated cartoon in 1975, video on that coming soon, but also various other remakes and uh, reimaginings. But it's the 1974 live-action TV show that I want to focus on today. Discussions of moving the Ape franchise from theaters to television was actually started by Arthur P. Jacobs as early as 1971 while they were filming Conquest. But because the theatrical films were doing so well in theaters, they decided to hold that idea off for just a little bit. Maybe not surprisingly, the budget the critical acclaim, and the profits from each of the subsequent Apes films dropped. So what do we do? Television, of course. Sadly, Arthur P. Jacobs would never see that dream realized because he passed away suddenly on June 27th of 1973. And he was only 51. His production company at that time sold all the rights to Planet of the Apes to 20th Century Fox. And in 1973, the rights for the first three Apes movies were sold to CBS for a whopping $1 million. The ratings for those CBS Apes movies of the weeks were astronomical. In fact, they had the highest rating for a sci-fi series on television up to that time. So, of course, thinking about profits, CBS moved those movies from afternoons to the Friday night movie slot. Man, do I remember those. Flipping through TV Guide right to Friday night just to see if there was an Apes movie on. Tonight, one of the screen's most terrifying dramas on the CBS Friday night movies, starring Charlton Heston. And around the same time, 20th Century Fox released all of the movies back in theaters for the very popular Go Ape promotion. CBS really wanted and needed a new hit for their network. The two main contenders at that time were Gene Roddenberry's Genesis 2 and Planet of the Apes. Nothing against Gene Roddenberry, but Planet of the Apes won out. The next year, CBS ordered 14 episodes to be produced. The budget? A whopping $250,000 per episode. Expensive. This series takes place in the year 3085, which is about 900 years before Taylor arrives, and 400 years after the events of battle. You want to drive yourself absolutely bananas? No pun intended. Go online and search Planet of the Apes timeline. Google it. Dive in and have fun. The cast of this show was fantastic. Ron Harper as Verdon. He was a very popular TV actor and was seen in the 87th Precinct, Garrison's Gorillas, and eventually ended up on the third season of Land of the Lost. I got my start in acting. Let me see. I, it seems to me I've been acting all my life. I'm doing acting just for the love of it which I guess is the reason why I got into it in the first place. James Naughton was cast as Burke, and even though his main love was theater, he did a lot of TVs and movies, including The Paper Chase, Who's the Boss, Law and & Order, Ally McBeal, and many, many more. 
His younger brother, David Naughton, also became a very successful actor. You might know him from American Werewolf in London. You had Roddy McDowell as Galen, and I really don't think we need any introduction for him. I played three different characters. I played Cornelius, then my own son, and then in the television series, another entirely different character called Galen, which I sort of liked the best. I had a great deal of fun playing it. Booth Coleman as Dr. Zayas, and the incredible Mark Leonard as Urko, or Urko, depending on who's saying his name in the show. Mark Leonard is most notably known as Sarek, Spock's father, on the original Star Trek TV series and movies. This was interesting. James Franciscus from Beneath the Planet of the Apes was offered the role of Verdon, but he turned it down. Wouldn't that have been cool? Popular TV actor Mark Singer also tried out, didn't get it, but he did get a role in one of the episodes. Twilight Zone creator Rod Serling penned two episodes for this series. The first being a pilot and the second being a follow-up to that pilot. The episodes he wrote were literally called episode one and episode two. However, the scripts he wrote were radically different than the way the network wanted to go, so they were rejected. But they are available to read on Hunter's Planet of the Apes archive, link in the description. Most of the filming took place at the Fox Ranch and out at Malibu State Park, which is where they filmed much of the footage for all the five movies. Malibu State Park was not only the home to Planet of the Apes, but other incredible shows like MASH and Logan's Run. However, all the shows where they had those barren, run-down cities, that was actually the MGM backlot. This new Planet of the Apes TV show was originally scheduled for Tuesdays during the family hour, but eventually premiered on Friday, September 13th, yes, Friday the 13th, from 8 o'clock until 9 o'clock. So many great shows in this very short half season. I'm not going to get to all of them. I'm just going to touch on a few of my favorites. Escape from Tomorrow, the very first episode. How can you not love that? There were some continuity issues between the movies and the TV show that didn't make much sense. In the Escape and Conquest movies, they made it really clear that all the dogs and cats were killed off. But the first thing we see in the first scene of the first episode is a dog. I guess the continuity director must have been out sick that day. This is so cool. The spacesuits that Verdon, Burke, and Jonesy are wearing in the first episode are the exact same ANSA spacesuits that the astronauts wore in the original Planet of the Apes movie from 1968. How cool is that? And the reason the spacesuit said ANSA is because they didn't have permission to have it say NASA, so they just switched two of the letters. The dynamic between Verdon and Burke was really interesting. Verdon, to me, always came across as this friendly science teacher, always teaching us how to do something. Here's how you make a battery. Here's how you grow crops. And Verdon's character never accepted his fate. Never. All the way through the series, all he wanted to do was get home, and he truly believed that one day he was going to find a way to do that. Eh. Burke, on the other hand, he's like, Ah, come on, Alan, this is where we are. Just deal with it. The first couple shows had this storyline revolving a disc that Verdon gets out of the ship that was crashed. Really would have been nice if they'd have pursued that but that was a storyline they just completely dropped. The ship, by the way, really cool. Apparently, this was the same ship that they used in all of the movies. Cast members and people who worked on the show always said that it was this plywood spaceship. It wasn't. It was steel and metal. And man, does that ship have an interesting story. Video on that coming soon. Stay tuned. One thing I always felt that might have been a problem is that these shows were episodic. You had one show with one story in one hour. Nothing really tied over from one show to the next the way it does these days, like with The Walking Dead. So I think that made it difficult to do things like character development and story arcs. Urko. God, I loved Urko. Such a one-dimensional character. All he ever wanted to do was kill the humans. That's it. 
One of the absolute best shows was called The Trap, where Burke and Urkel fall into a hole and they actually have to help each other in order to get out. And in the end, does Urko thank him for getting him out of the hole? No, shoot him! Shoot him! <laughs> but he's a gorilla. What do you expect? The Legacy. That was an incredible show. Verdon, Burke, and Galen find this buried computer that puts up a projection of a human explaining to them that all of the combined knowledge of man has been hidden in vaults scattered throughout the world. It would have been so cool to have a continued storyline of Verdon, Burke, and Galen trying to go to these different vaults throughout the world to gather the information they needed to maybe get back to Earth. Nah, they just dropped that storyline. Cool fact. The outfit the guy is wearing is the same costume as the mutants in Beneath the Planet of the Apes. Could he be an early descendant? Lines are open, you decide. The Deception was a really, really neat show, very interesting drama, about a female chimpanzee who actually falls in love with Burke. The interrogation, Burke is captured and interrogated. Really good acting chops in this one by James Naughton. In this show, we also meet Galen's parents, and there are themes of prejudice that are touched on. Stuff that obviously kids aren't going to be interested in, but it is kind of following the pattern of the social commentary that the original Apes movie laid out. The Tyrant. Oh man, did I love this particular show. A high-ranking gorilla is trying to assassinate Urko and take over his position. Very interesting the way it eventually played out with Galen, Verdon, and Burke trying to convince Urko that his life is in danger. The last episode in the series was called Up Above the World So High, and it was about a guy who creates a glider. What's interesting about this show, and a little disconcerting, is there's this female chimpanzee who wants to take the glider, put bombs on it, and go destroy Ape City and overthrow the government. <laughs> what the heck? Well, it certainly looked like this show was going to be a huge hit, but it didn't happen. But why? Very simple. Ratings. That's it. The first episode debuted in only 43rd place. Very disappointing. The cost of each episode with the makeup and the sets was just very expensive to produce. They pulled the plug on it a little quickly. And that happens sometimes. It was an expensive show to run. It was like a half a season, a little more than half a season long. I'm not quite sure what went wrong. There are actually interviews of people who worked on the show back then who literally attributed the low ratings partially due to the fact that they didn't feel there were enough apes in the shows. Here's a cool Star Trek Planet of the Apes tie-in. As the ratings for this show were dwindling lower and lower, Gene Roddenberry came in as a consultant. What Gene wanted to do, just to help out, was to get a new effects company to come in to do all new special effects to make everything look bigger and grander and try to tie the show into the timeline of the original 1968 Planet of the Apes movie. How cool would that have been? But it never happened. You know, also, the kids did tune in. They really did. And it's too bad that that show didn't work uh, because kids adored it. The premise is entirely viable and, and very entertaining to children. All children wanted to be the chimpanzee, including me. But according to the network, that's not the audience we're trying to attract. God, network executives. And finally, it was in the same time slot as Sanford and Son and Chico and the Man. And Planet of the Apes just couldn't cut it. Now, had the show been run earlier, from 7.30 to 8.30? Maybe. In 1980, 1981, they did something really interesting with these TV shows. Fox took 10 of the shows and cut them down into five two-hour movies. These were movies that were primarily shown in the afternoons, after-school kind of stuff. But what was cool... And I mean, really cool is that when ABC and only ABC, who purchased the rights for these, ran them on their networks, they got Roddy McDowell to come back in, reprise his role as older Galen, and do headers and footers to each of these little mini-movies. 
I, I didn't expect you so soon. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Galen. And even though there was actually no last show where Vernon and Bert got home, Galen, on one of these bumpers, did spill the beans. Vernon and Bert? Oh, well, they found their computer in another city and disappeared into space as suddenly as they arrived. They made it. The only astronauts in Planet of the Apes history to actually make it back home. I'll bet Taylor was pissed. The people who liked it sure do love it, and they have been incredibly loyal to it. I'm surprised that I'm still getting fan mail for that 40 years later. I get two or three letters a week with photographs from the shows asking for autographs. So the Planet of the Apes TV series was gone, but not forgotten. Since that time, we've had a wide variety of comics and books. The toys. Oh, man, such incredible apes toys. We had all the Mego dolls. We had the treehouse, the board game, masks, guns, the incredible bubblegum cards, blow-up figures, Banks and so much more. I wish I could have had it all and still do. The opening theme music is fantastic and iconic. The theme was written by a composer named Lalo Schifrin, who also scored three entire additional episodes. And if you want to add the soundtrack to your collection, there is both a normal and expanded edition available. Sadly, this set was never released on Blu ray. What would it take? One disc? Come on, Disney. <sighs> Fox had an idea for a relaunch in 1988 that would have been a direct sequel to the original Planet of the Apes, ignoring the other sequels. But that was scrapped. Then, in the 1990s, Oliver Stone came in with a story idea starring Arnold Schwarzenegger as a character named Will Robinson. No joke, that's true. Could you imagine? I'll be back to kill apes. But that was scrapped. Then a filmmaker named Chris Columbus came in with his idea. That was scrapped. There was, however, a very interesting reimagining by Tim Burton in 2001. Don't get me wrong, the makeup was awesome, but the story and the casting choices... <laughs> Then Fox launched a brand new digital trilogy starting in 2014 that did really, really well. And now, as of January 2024, Disney is going to give it a shot. <coughs> but that, my friends, is the topic of a different video. I really want to thank everybody for stopping by, and if you're new to the channel, please consider liking and subscribing if you like this kind of stuff. If you have any questions, drop them in the comments, and I'll be more than happy to try to answer them for you. This channel has gone crazy in the last month. We're up to over 17,000 subscribers, so thank you. And as always, please feel free to stop by anytime as we continue talking about movies, music, and monsters. Movies, music, and monsters. Danger.